Seth Speaks the Eternal Validity of the Soul by Jane Roberts, read by Martin John, Continuation Part 1, Chapter 6, The Soul and the Nature of Its Perception, Session 526, May 4, 1970, 10 p.m., Monday. Good evening. We will have a short session and begin to dictate the next chapter. With a little background given so far, we can at least begin to discuss the subject of this book, the eternal validity of the soul. Even when we are exploring other issues, we'll be trying to illustrate the multi-dimensional aspect of this inner self. There are many misconceptions connected with it, and first of all, we shall try to dismiss these. First of all, a soul is not something that you have. It is what you are. I usually use the term entity in preference to the term soul simply because those particular misconceptions are not so connected with the word entity and its connotations are less religious in an organizational sense. The trouble is that you frequently consider the soul or entity as a finished static thing that belongs to you but is not you. The soul or entity, in other words, your most intimate, powerful inner identity, is and must be forever changing. It is not, therefore, something like a cherished heirloom. It is alive, responsive, curious. It forms the flesh and the world that you know, and it is in a state of becoming. Now, in the three-dimensional reality in which your ego has its main focus, becoming presupposes arrival or a destination, an ending to that which has been in a state of becoming. But the soul or entity has its existence basically in other dimensions, and in these, fulfillment is not dependent upon arrivals at any points spiritual or otherwise. The soul or entity is always in a state of flux or learning and of developments that have to do with subjective experience rather than with time or space. This is not nearly as mysterious as it might sound. Each of my readers plays a game in which the egotistical conscious self pretends not to know what the whole self definitely does know. Since the ego is definitely a part of the whole self, then it must necessarily be basically aware of such knowledge. In its intense focus in physical reality, however, it pretends not to know until it feels able to utilize the formation in physical terms. You do have access to the inner self, therefore. You are hardly cut off from your own soul or entity. The ego prefers to consider itself the captain at the helm, so to speak, since it is the ego who most directly deals with the sometimes tumultuous seas of physical reality, and it does not want to be distracted from the task. Channels, psychological and psychic, always exist, sending communications back and forth through the various levels of the self, and the ego accepts necessary information and data from inner portions of the personality without question. Its position, in fact, depends in a large manner upon the unquestioning acceptance of inner data. The ego, in other words, the exterior self that you think of as yourself, that portion of you maintains its safety and its seeming command precisely because 
inner layers of your own personality constantly uphold it keep the physical body operating and maintain communications with the multitudinous stimuli that come both from outside conditions and inside conditions the soul or entity is not diminished but expanded through reincarnations through existence and experience in probable realities something that i will explain later it is only because you have a highly limited conception of your own entity that you insist upon its being almost sterile in its singularity there are millions of cells within your body but you call your body a unit and consider it your own you do form it from the inside out and yet you form it from living substance and each smallest particle has its own living consciousness there are clumps of matter and in that respect there are clumps of consciousness each individual with their own destiny and abilities and potentials there are no limitations to your own entity therefore how can your entity or soul have boundaries for boundaries would enclose it and deny it freedom you may take your break often it seems that the soul is thought of as a precious stone to be finally presented as a gift to god or considered as some women used to be considered their virginity something highly prized that must be lost the losing of it being signified as a fine gift to the receiver in many philosophies this sort of idea is retained the soul being returned to a primal giver or being dissolved in a nebulous state somewhere between being and non-being the soul is however first of all creative it can be discussed from many viewpoints its characteristics can be given to some degree and indeed most of my readers could find out these characteristics for themselves if they were highly enough motivated and if this was their main concern the soul or entity is itself the most highly motivated most highly energized and most potent consciousness unit known in any universe it is energy concentrated to a degree quite unbelievable to you it contains potentials unlimited but it must work out its own identity and form its own worlds it carries within it the burden of all being within it are personality potentials beyond your comprehension remember this is your own soul or entity i am speaking of as well as soul or entity in general you are one manifestation of your own soul how many of you would want to limit your reality your entire reality to the experience you know now you do this when you imagine that your present self is your entire personality or insist that your identity be maintained unchanged through an endless eternity such an eternity would be dead indeed in many ways the soul is an incipient god and later in this book we will discuss the god concept for now however we will simply be concerned with the entity or soul the larger self that whispers even now in the hidden recesses of each reader's experience i hope in this book not only to assure you of the eternal validity of your soul or entity but to help you sense its vital reality within yourself first of all however you must have some idea of your own psychological and psychic structure when you understand to some extent who and what you are then i can explain more clearly who and what i am i hope to acquaint you with those deeply creative aspects of your own being so that you can use these to extend and expand your entire experience 
That is the end of dictation. Now give me a moment. I wanted to begin this chapter. It always makes Rupert feel better. It ends the suspense as to what the next chapter will be. But give me a moment here. Remember, in your portrait, the sense of play and a light hand. Otherwise, you lose your sparkling colors and end up with a murkiness that you do not intend. Remember that the soul is plain behind the facade that you see, that even the body is in a constant state of almost magical activity, even though, as you paint it in its chair, it is physically motionless. You want the feeling within that apparent state of motionlessness, of highly accelerated, contained activity that cannot be physically expressed, that must radiate from the painting despite the obvious and illusionary appearance of your figure. You are stressing perhaps too strongly the aspects of the chair as the binding elements that hold your figure more or less stationary. He, of course, also creates the chair, as you know, and therefore the limitations. I believe there is some difficulty, or was, with the lower right-hand corner, a matter perhaps of needing more transparent lights, not too obviously applied, however. You're working these matters out. Do you have any questions? Session 527, May 11, 1970, 912 p.m. Monday. Good evening. We will continue with the chapter we began. Many individuals imagine the soul to be an immortalized ego, forgetting that the ego as you know it is only a small portion of the self. So this section of the personality is simply projected outward, ad infinitum, so to speak, because the dimensions of your reality are so little understood. Your concepts are bound to be limited. In considering immortality, mankind seems to hope for further egotistical development. And yet he objects to the idea that such development might involve change. He says through his religions that he has a soul indeed, without even asking what a soul is. And often he seems to regard it, again, as an object in his possession. Now, personality, even as you know it, constantly changes and not always in ways that are anticipated, most often, in fact, in unpredictable ways. You insist upon focusing your attention upon the similarities that are woven through your own behavior, and upon these you build a theory that the self follows a pattern that you, instead, have transposed upon it and the transposed pattern prevents you from seeing the self as it really is. Therefore, you also project this distorted viewpoint upon your conception of the reality of the soul. You think of the soul, therefore, in the light of erroneous conceptions that you hold regarding even the nature of your mortal selves. Even the mortal self, you see, is far more miraculous and wondrous than you perceive, and possesses far more abilities than you ascribe it. You do not understand as yet the true nature of perception, even as far as the mortal self is concerned, and therefore you can hardly understand the perceptions of the soul, for the soul, above all, perceives and creates Remember again that you are a soul now. The soul within you, therefore, is now perceiving. Its methods of perception are the same now as they were before your physical birth, and as they will be after your physical death. So basically the inner portion of you, the soul stuff, 
will not suddenly change its methods of perception nor its characteristics after physical death you can find out what the soul is now therefore it is not something waiting for you at your death nor is it something you must save or redeem and it is also something that you cannot lose the term to lose or save your soul has been grossly misinterpreted and distorted for it is the part of you that is indeed indestructible we will go into this particular matter in a portion of the book dealing with religion and the god concept your own personality as you know it that portion of you that you consider most precious most uniquely you will also never be destroyed or lost it is a portion of the soul it will not be gobbled by the soul nor erased by it nor subjugated by it nor on the other hand can it ever be separated it is nevertheless only one aspect of your soul your individuality in whatever way you want to think of it continues to exist in your terms it continues to grow and develop but its growth and development is highly dependent upon its realization that while it is distinct and individual it is also but one manifestation of the soul to the extent that it realizes this it learns to unfold in creativity and to use those abilities that lie inherent within it now unfortunately it would be much easier simply to tell you that your individuality continues to exist and let it go at that while this would make a fairly reasonable parable it has been told in that particular way before and there are dangers in the very simplicity of the tale the truth is that the personality you are now and the personality that you have been and will be in the terms in which you understand time all of these personalities are manifestations of the soul of your soul your soul therefore the soul that you are the soul that you are a part of that soul is a far more creative and miraculous phenomenon than you previously supposed and when this is not clearly understood and when the concept is watered down for simplicity's sake as mentioned earlier then the intense validity of the soul can never be understood your soul therefore possesses the wisdom information and knowledge that is part of the experience of all these other personalities and you have within yourselves access to this information but only if you realize the true nature of your reality let me emphasize again that these personalities exist independently within and are a part of the soul and each of them are free to create and develop there is however an inner communication and the knowledge of one is available to any not after physical death but now in your present moment now the soul itself as mentioned earlier is not static it grows and develops even through the experience of those personalities that compose it and it is to put it as simply as possible more than the sum of its parts now there are no closed systems in reality in your physical system the nature of your perceptions limit your idea of reality to some extent because you purposely decide to focus within a given locale but basically speaking consciousness can never be a closed system and all barriers of such a nature are illusion therefore the soul itself is not a closed system when you consider the soul however you usually think of it in such a light unchanging 
a psychic or spiritual citadel. But citadels not only keep out invaders, they also prevent expansion and development. There are many matters here very difficult to express in words, for you are so afraid for your sense of identity that you resist the idea that the soul, for example, is an open spiritual system, a powerhouse of creativity that shoots out in all directions. And yet this is indeed the case. I tell you this, and at the same time remind you that your present personality is never lost. Now another word for the soul is entity. You see it is not a simple matter of giving you a definition of a soul or entity, for even to have a glimpse in logical terms you would have to understand it in spiritual, psychic, and electromagnetic terms and understand the basic nature of consciousness and action as well. But you can intuitively discover the nature of the soul or entity, and in many ways intuitive knowledge is superior to any other kind. One prerequisite for such an intuitive understanding of the soul is the desire to achieve it. If the desire is strong enough, then you will be automatically led to experiences that will result in vivid, unmistakable, subjective knowledge. There are methods that will enable you to do this, and I will give you some toward the end of this book. For now, here is one quite effective but simple exercise. Close your eyes after having read this chapter to this point and try to sense within yourself the source of power from which your own breathing and life forces come. Some of you will do this successfully at your first try. Others may take longer. When you feel within yourself this source, then try to sense this power flow outward through your entire physical being, through the fingertips and toes, through the pores of your body, radiating outward from your physical form like rays in all directions with yourself as center. Imagine the rays undiminished, reaching then through the foliage and clouds above, through the center of the earth below, extending even to the furthest reaches of the universe. Now I do not mean this to be merely a symbolic exercise, for though it may begin with imagination, it is based upon fact, and emancipations from your consciousness and the creativity of your soul do indeed reach outward in that manner. The exercise will give you some idea of the true nature, creativity, and vitality of the soul from which you can draw your own energy and which you are an individual and unique portion. You may take your break. This discussion is not meant to be an esoteric presentation with little practical meaning in your daily lives. The fact is that while you hold limited concepts of your own reality, then you cannot practically take advantage of many abilities that are your own. And while you have a limited concept of the soul, then to some extent you cut off from the source of your own being and creativity. Now these abilities operate whether you know it or not but often they operate in spite of you rather than with your conscious cooperation and often when you do find yourself using them you become frightened disoriented or confused no matter what you have been taught you must understand for example that basically speaking perceptions are not physical in the way the term is usually used if you catch yourself perceiving information through other than your physical senses, then you must accept the fact that this is the way perception works. 
what often happens is that your conception of reality is so limited that you take fright whenever you perceive any experience that does not fit into your conception. Now, I am not speaking merely of abilities loosely called extrasensory perception. These experiences seem extraordinary to you only because you have for so long denied the existence of any perception that did not come through the physical senses. So-called extrasensory perception gives you but a crude and distorted idea of the basic ways in which the inner self receives information. But the concepts built around extrasensory perception are at least nearer the truth and as such represent an improvement over the idea that all perception is basically physical. Now it is nearly impossible to separate a discussion of the nature of the soul from a discussion of the nature of perception. Very briefly, let us review a few points. You form physical matter and the physical world that you know. The physical senses actually can be said to create the physical world in that they force you to perceive an available field of energy in physical terms and impose a highly specialized pattern upon this field of reality. Using the physical senses, you can perceive reality in no other way. This physical perception in no way alters the native, basic, unfettered perception that is characteristic of the inner self, the inner self being that portion of the soul that is within you. The inner self knows its relationship with the soul. It is a portion of the self that acts, you might say, as a messenger between the soul and the present personality. You must also realize that while I use terms like soul or entity, inner self, and present personality, I do so only for the sake of convenience, for one is a part of the other. There is no point where one begins and another ends. You can see this easily for yourself if you consider the way in which psychologists use the term ego, subconscious, and even unconscious. What seems subconscious in one instant may be conscious the next. An unconscious motive may also be conscious at one point. Even in these terms, your experience should tell you that the words themselves make divisions that do not exist in your own experience. You seem to perceive exclusively through your physical senses, and yet you have only to extend your egotistical idea of reality, and you will find even your egotistical self accepting quite readily the existence of non-physical information. As it does, so its own ideas of its own nature will automatically change and expand, for you will have removed limitations to its growth. Now, any act of perception changes the perceiver, and so the soul, considered as a perceiver, must also change. There are no real divisions between the perceiver and the thing seemingly perceived. In many ways, the thing perceived is an extension of the perceiver. This may seem strange, but all acts are mental, or if you prefer, psychic acts. This is an extremely simple explanation, but the thought creates the reality. Then the creator of the thought perceives the object, and he does not understand the connection between him and this seemingly separate thing. This characteristic of materializing thoughts and emotions into physical realities is an attribute of the soul. Now in your reality, these thoughts are made physical. In other realities, they may be constructed in an entirely different fashion. So your soul, that which you are, 
constructs your physical daily reality for you from the nature of your thoughts and expectations. You can readily see, therefore, how important your subjective feelings really are. This knowledge that your universe is idea construction can immediately give you clues that enable you to change your environment and circumstances beneficially. When you do not understand the nature of the soul and do not realize that your thoughts and feelings form physical reality, then you feel powerless to change it. In later chapters of this book, I hope to give you some practical information that will enable you to alter practically the very nature and structure of your daily life. End of session. Session 528, May 13, 1970, 9.03 p.m. Wednesday. Good evening. It is the winter's hour, and we will resume dictation. The soul perceives all experience directly. Most experiences of which you are aware come packaged in physical wrapping, and you take the wrapping for the experience itself, and do not think of looking inside. The world that you know is one of the infinite materializations taken by consciousness, and as such it is valid. The soul, however, does not need to follow the laws and principles that are a part of the physical reality, and it does not depend upon physical perception. The soul's perceptions are of acts and events that are mental, that lie, so to speak, beneath physical events as you know them. The soul's perceptions are not dependent upon time, because time is a physical camouflage and does not apply to non-physical reality. Now it is difficult to explain to you how direct experience actually works, for it exists a total field of perception, innocent of the physical clues such as color, size, weight, and sense with which your physical perceptions are clothed. Words are used to tell of an experience, but they obviously are not the experience that they attempt to describe. Your physical subjective experience is so involved with word thinking, however, that it is almost impossible for you to conceive of an experience that is not thought word oriented. Now, each event of which you are aware is already a translation of an inner event, a psychic or mental event that is perceived by the soul directly, but translated by the physically oriented portions of the self into physical sense terms. It goes without saying, then, that the soul does not require a physical body for purposes of perception, that perception is not dependent upon physical senses, that experience continues whether or not you are in this life or another, and also that the soul's basic methods of perception are also operating within you now even as you read this book. It also follows that your experience within the physical system is dependent upon a physical form and physical senses. Again, because these interpret reality and translate it into physical data, it also follows that some hints of the soul's direct experience can be gained by momentarily switching the physical senses off by refusing to use them as perceptors and falling back upon other methods. Now you do this to some extent in the dream state, but even then in many dreams you still tend to translate experience into hallucinatory physical terms. Most of the dreams that you recall are of this nature. At certain depths of sleep, however, the soul's perception operates relatively unhampered. 
You drink, so to speak, from the pure well of perception. You communicate with the depths of your own being and the source of your creativity. These experiences not being translated physically do not remain in the morning. You do not remember them as dreams. Dreams, however, may later the same evening be formed from the information gained during what I will call the depth experience. These will not be exact or near translations of the experience, but rather of the nature of dream parables. An entirely different thing, you see. This particular level of consciousness occurring in the sleep state has not been pinpointed by your scientists. During it, energy is generated that makes the dream state itself possible. It is true that dreams allow the physically oriented self to digest current experience, but it is also true that the experience is then returned to its initial components. It breaks apart, so to speak, Portions of it are retained as past physical sense data, but the whole experience returns to its initial direct state. It exists then eternally, separated from the physical clothing that you need in order to understand it. Physical existence is one way in which the soul chooses to experience its own actuality. The soul, in other words, has created a world for you to inhabit, to change, a complete sphere of activity in which new developments and indeed new forms of consciousness can emerge. In a manner of speaking, you continually create your soul as it continually creates you. You may take a break. Now, the soul is never diminished, nor basically are any portions of the self. The soul can be considered as an electromagnetic energy field, of which you are a part. It is a field of concentrated action when you consider it in this light, a powerhouse of probabilities or probable actions, seeking to be expressed a grouping of non-physical consciousness that nevertheless knows itself as an identity. Look at it this way. The young woman through whom I speak once stated in a poem, and I quote, These atoms speak and call themselves my name. Now your physical body is a field of energy with a certain form, however, and when someone asks you your name, your lips speak it, and yet the name does not belong to the atoms and the molecules in the lips that utter the syllables. The name has meaning only to you. Within your body, you cannot put your finger upon your own identity. If you could travel within your body, you could not find where your identity resides. Yet you say, this is my body, and this is my name. If you cannot be found, even by yourself, within your body, then where is this identity of yours that claims to hold the cells and organs as its own? Your identity obviously has some connection with your body, since you have no trouble distinguishing your body from someone else's, and you certainly have no trouble distinguishing between your body and the chair, say, upon which you sit. In a larger manner, the identity of the soul can be seen from the same viewpoint. It knows who it is, and is far more certain of its identity, indeed, than your physical self is of its identity. And yet now, where in the electromagnetic energy field can the identity of the soul as such be found? Question. It regenerates all other portions of itself and gives you the identity that is your own. And when it should be asked, who are you? It would simply answer, I am I, and be answering for you also. 
Now, in terms of psychology as you understand it, the soul could be considered a prime identity that is in itself a gestalt of many other individual consciousnesses, an unlimited self that is yet able to express itself in many ways and forms and yet maintain its own identity, its own I amness even while it is aware that its I amness may be part of an another I amness. Now I am sure it may seem inconceivable to you, but the fact is that this I amness is retained, even though it may, figuratively speaking, now merge with and travel through other such energy fields. There is, in other words, a give and take between souls or entities, and no end of possibilities, both of development and expansion. Again, the soul is not a closed system. It is only because your present existence is so highly focused in one narrow area that you put such stern limits upon your definitions of the self and then project these upon your concepts of the soul. You worry for your physical identity and limit the extent of your perceptions for fear you cannot handle more and retain your selfhood. The soul is not frightened for its identity. It is sure of itself. It ever seeks. It is not afraid of being overwhelmed by experience or perception. If you had a more thorough understanding of the nature of identity, you would not, for example, fear telepathy. For behind this concern is the worry that your identity will be swept away by the suggestions or thoughts of others. No psychological system is closed, no consciousness is closed, regardless of any appearances to the contrary within your own system. The soul is a traveler, as has been said so often, but it is also the creator of all experience and of all dimensions in your terms. It creates worlds as it goes, so to speak. Now this is the true nature of the psychological being of which you are a part. As mentioned earlier, later in this book I will give you some practical suggestions that will allow you to recognize some of your own deeper abilities and utilize them for your own development, pleasure, and education. Consciousness is not basically built upon those precepts of good and evil that so presently concern you. By inference, neither is a soul. This does not mean that your system, and in some others, these problems do not exist and that good is not preferable to the evil. It simply means that the soul knows that good and evil are but different manifestations of a far greater reality. Now you may take your break. I want to emphasize again that while all this sounds difficult in the telling, it becomes much more clear intuitively when you learn to experience what you are. For if you cannot travel inside your physical body to find your identity, you can travel through your psychological self. There are far more wonders to perceive through this inward exploration than you can possibly believe until you begin such a journey for yourself. You are a soul. You are a particular manifestation of a soul. And it is sheer nonsense to think that you must remain ignorant of the nature of your own being. You may not be able to put your knowledge clearly into words, but this will in no way negate the value or the validity of the experience that will be yours once you begin to look inward. Now you may call this a spiritual or psychological or psychic exploration, as you prefer. You will not be trying to find your soul 
well, in that respect there is nothing to find it is not lost and you are not lost the words you use may make no difference but your intent does indeed end of dictation peace light and love into chapter six Allah.